Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we look at today's book, I want to let everyone know that we do have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon available now. Three different tiers. It'll give you access to videos ahead of time. It'll give you access to some exclusive videos and access to us. So check that out. If that is up your alley, that is patreon.com slash cartoonist kayfabe. And no fear, if you're not into Patreon, you will still be receiving Cartoonist Kayfabe videos every day here on YouTube. Also, we are working cartoonists, and the best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe is to buy our books. Ed has Red Room, Hip Hop Family Tree, X-Men Grand Design, and WYSIWYG, all available and in print wherever books are bought and sold. You can find my latest books, Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, The Plain Janes, and coming very soon, Hulk Grand Design. You may want to put a pre-order in for that one if you haven't already. But the business at hand today is something we promised a while back. From 10 years of Love and Rockets and also reprinted in the new Love and Rockets box set, we're going to look at Gilbert Hernandez's process. How to make comics the Gilbert Hernandez way, and I I don't think you can find a much better teacher uh, than than that guy if you you try your damnedest. Absolutely. Uh, We have already looked at Jaime's contribution from this book, so check that one out in our past videos. And we do have a Love and Rockets uh, playlist so that you can check out all our Lowe's Bros coverage. Yeah, one of one of the great comics and two of the great cartoonists. And it's so cool that this exists. Ed, I wish I would have found this whenever this book was originally published. I know, right? Man, it would have been big for me growing up, but better late than never. Yes, and, and we could we could spread the gospel, we could spread the wisdom as we are checking this thing out. And I think it's even within the body of that first paragraph where he talks about how like the art of comics is intertwined between art and and writing and that is like the perfect, you know, like when you're a kid doing your oration in front of the class, it's like you have your intro and then you have your, your conclusion. Like as an intro, it explains the body of the rest of the conversation throughout where he's, it's, he's almost talking about the writing more than just like the aesthetics. Uh, talks a lot about Jaime. He does, which makes sense. You know, you're appearing in a book with one of the, the, all-time great drawers. He's, he's making acknowledgments, too. He's like, listen, I know Jaime's the sexy one. Uh, my style's gruffer, uh, but here's how I make it work for me. Yeah, and so we start right off the bat with style, where he's comparing himself to Jaime and, you know, talking about being a little sloppier, a little craggier, and stylizing more, which is all really interesting because... I love Jaime's work, but I also love Beto's work yeah. uh, and, and the visuals of his work, you know, his art. Like, I'm a big fan of his art. So it's interesting to see, like, maybe a little bit of insecurity uh, on his part, you know, comparing himself to his brothers, which is natural. Like, every cartoonist tends to go through some period where you're comparing yourself to others and, and maybe not feeling as good about your own work. It's amazing to see a master like Gilbert also has that experience. That's so kind of cool right off the bat to feel a little bit of... Even a great artist has some of these insecurities that we all experience at some point or another. But I like the stuff that he says about stylizing more and being a little bit sloppier because actually, as a reader, as a fan, I like the stylize. You know, I I, I wish I, I want to stylize my own work more. Yeah. And I look at somebody like Beto and it's a real inspiration to me in terms me of thinking in, in style. And so it's really cool right off the bat. That's what he starts with. Yeah. And, and I think that his work, like despite the words that we're reading on the pages here, I think that the work really uh, disavows any kind of uh, self-consciousness. Right. Uh, when when he's putting pen to paper, like he's he's doing himself, man, and he's slinging, you see it right here, he's slinging a big thick brush, he's slinging uh, pens, and just kind of, he's making his comics. It says he uses a thin brush. Yes. To get them thick lines. Also talks about the example that he gives is like whenever he has a character or something rough like Luba, He'll have Luba fully pregnant, drinking and shooting up heroin all at once. An illustration of sort of like if he's going to uh, to, to do this, this describe a character kind of going off the rails or whatever, he pushes it. Yeah. And I like that. That's that's what I talk about with cartoony and stylized. Um, to me, that's that works really well. Like totally. I, I've read his books before, you know, late at night before I go to bed. And it's so they're so easy to read because of this. You know, like it's very clear what's happening and what characters are feeling, you know, like they're emoting through the, the visuals that he chooses. It's interesting, too, because he points out like maybe even an insecurity on uh, Jaime's part, because once again, and, and it's just going to go back and forth because he, he calls Jaime's name out a lot throughout this thing. So that's an example of like how he pushes things. But he explains how his brother will kind of do the same with with like zappy, you know, uh, stars above somebody's head mm-hmm. and stuff. But like. 
that his brother doesn't need to. Like the naturalistic flow and the uh, facial expressions, all that stuff, completely sell the idea of like what his characters are going through, but he still uses that cartoon language when he doesn't have to. Says that like Jaime, he draws on 11 by 14 inch paper. I may try that on my next comic. Mm-hmm. You know, working just a little bit smaller, but uh, keep, keep in mind at, at this time their magazine. comics, their comics are not like this. So uh, their comics, you know, it's inch border around, uh, half inch border around uh, the whole thing, working in a, a square shape. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, that's because, very true. Because it's you know three inches difference on the side. Um, and this is where he talks about switching to a brush. It says, didn't start using a brush until issue 12. I was going to pull issues like 11 and 12 uh-huh. to compare. I think that's interesting because I do think of his work as being a brush, but apparently not, in the, at least not in the uh, in the very beginning. Um, as you say, does use a, uh, a very fine brush, like a double aught. You know, like a lot of times when you read, I don't know, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, it's a size two, yeah. maybe even a size three sometimes that people recommend. So and the guys a double are, zero, very small. Right, because the guys who are badasses at those brushes, and he acknowledges, they're able to get the double zero type lines with a thick brush. It's just you have the benefits of also being able to get very bold lines. And he's just like, you know what, I'm just not there. Yeah, and he and he describes like the mechanics between using a crow quill or a pencil or a ballpoint pen, where like the device is resting on the page, but with a brush, it's your wrist. Yeah, you know, like you're barely touching. So kind of neat to see it, just some of the mechanical talk of that. So, so I think one of the things that you might have had in mind whenever you said you wish you would have saw this, like when it came out, is off the bat we're getting examples uh, of tools and things that have nothing to do with how to draw comics the Marvel way. And those rigid tools and the rigid format, you know, 11 by 17 with the 10 by 15 image area, that shit was drilled into our yeah. heads. And it felt like your amateur hour, if you're not using all that right stuff. I remember even like coming out of art school thinking that, uh, man, my lettering teacher is going to be so disappointed in me if he finds out that I'm lettering with a um, rapidograph. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm being an amateur lettering with this rapidograph and stuff. This would have made you feel better because he, he letters with rapidograph. Yeah, all that stuff, man. Like like seeing that kind of thing and then it's just like you have to, you just have to um, make peace with it. Like like the truth is there are no rules. Everybody has their philosophies and stuff and there are choices that you personally as a creator have to make. Like if you want to make hit stuff, you, you there's two ways to do it. You could be an innovator and invent something or you can do the style du jour and maybe ride that wave. Uh, that's a safer play, and you might get tossed out with the with the kitty litter um, whenever the styles shift in terms of like mainstream taste. The cool thing about the bros is that they've always been true to themselves with their comics. Yeah, they worked out all that stuff. I think as kids. Yeah, you know, I think they've been making comics long before they started. We started seeing the published results. This is great in in these uh, in these process articles because they show a page in progress here on the left and then the finish and you can kind of see like what's drawn first what he's doing first and even leaving some of these panels like open like kind of like maybe working out that idea as he's inking in some backgrounds or inking in the panels that he's more confident with and he kind of talks about that through this process says that he writes the stories out first but usually in panel to panel sequence yeah and I'm not 100% clear on that. Like, is that like thumbnailing? Is that kind of what he's describing, do you think? Yeah, I think it's probably like on a piece of typing paper or something like that, just kind of get, getting the beats down. It's not the final boards, if that if that's where your confusion might be. I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not that level. Like, even making comics like that, you got to have your blueprint. Mm-hmm. But he does describe that, that Jaime's process is different. You know, like Jaime is, is making movie scripts that he's, that he's drawing from and sort of knows what's going in each panel. He's kind of a operating a little bit more intuitively in a certain certain uh, sense, which is actually baffling to me with the complexity of uh, a lot of his stories. Yes. Yeah, and, and he describes, like, again, with these two panels, or these two pages as examples, describes, like, considering different treatments. Uh, you know, even at this, like, at the end of the story, different treatments of how to resolve it. It's amazing to me, and it I think... It is shocking because the stories I do think of as complex, like has huge cast and like all the characters have agency. So to be able to leave certain things up in the air with that many pieces that are moving around is remarkable. But the flip side is I think you end up with real life on those pages. Yes. Because of that kind of spontaneity on his part. Like you hear so many people talk about 
if I could capture the energy of my roughs right. or my layouts or my pencils, but each stage tends to take that life away. Yeah. So if you're making these decisions, like on the last page of a story, you're working out how you're going to wrap certain details up. I think that lends itself to a real vitality. Yeah. At least I read that, you know, like it's one of the things I love about both their stories is it feels like it's the characters are alive. Yeah. And that's magic stuff. Like, I don't know that you get that in a how to exactly, but seeing kind of the glimpse of him putting together the final pages, it does. That's what I take away from that. I read a lot of stuff recently and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because it could have been an Otomo interview I read. uh, But was it Gilbert in the pages of this who said that uh, he'll begin a story and he's been at it long enough to um, not know where it's going while he's embarking upon it, but allowing the pieces to kind of fall into place as he makes it. Like, is that him or, or was that Otomo? Here's what he says. I think that's probably him. Jaime and I do have the knack for bringing in something out of left field and figuring out some way to make it connect. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another one of those like real lively pieces where like... You almost paint yourself into a corner. Yeah. You know, it's 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 very fun. He also talks about how um, he's always looking at TV and mainstream movies, and that's what he doesn't want it to be like. Right. And I think that's really telling because I do think of Gilbert as like a, a very conscious of pop culture and a great knowledge of pop culture and pop culture history. And I think we say this a lot. Sometimes you're, the lesson isn't how to make it like that. It's how to avoid this or that mistake. For so sure. it's funny to think of a guy that's consuming a lot of pop culture storytelling, but consuming it in a way to like, I don't want to repeat that. Yeah, I don't I think, want to be that way. I think they both share that trait. And the idea of introducing something into from out of left field is what all the great writers talk about in like their master classes or in interviews and stuff. And part of that is if they don't know how to get out of it at that moment that it's introduced or something, then the reader surely doesn't know. And then you, you could expand upon that further with, uh, remember in the 20 teens, I believe, maybe even the aughts, uh, there was released a, um, like a little missive from Pixar. Like it was like a one page thing that talked about how they like build story. And one of the pieces was you like, you create the problem and then you come up with like five solutions. And when you, produce like the next sequence you never go with solution a b or c like you go with like the d solution because those are like the in you know in order of obviousness i guess yeah but you've got to come up with like five solutions to every problem that you introduce and then try to think of the most interesting way to make the fifth choice work for your comic talks about page structure This story that he had been doing, the Love and Rockets story, is on nine-panel grids. Yeah. But other stories vary, um, you know, compares it to nine-panel grid versus an eight-panel grid and kind of like how he feels the nine-panel grid actually makes the panels feel bigger. And, and, you know, he's saying that because of the the magazine format. You like, you have that wide space because it just doesn't quite, like, look at that. That's almost squares. Mm Mm-hmm. And you don't have that on like ten by fifteen, like comic pamphlet size. They're, they're very clear, like rectangles, uh, with that are very narrow. Um, so, so that's specific to a more square page uh, composition. And then he talks about like Poison River and doing different size panels, and and how he chooses panel sizes based on maybe how much info is in those panels. Maybe you get a bigger panel. Here's that eight page or two. You you know at that at that same scale, so you could see that. You know, it's kind of wide, and, and it, it does. It, it looks it looks a little smaller in a way. Um, at keeping that rigid, you know, keeping that that panel composition rigid, there is so much value to that in terms of like in terms of just writing, and certainly in terms of composing the page because you just don't have to think about being sexy. You know, this is the uh, complete opposite end of the spectrum of like those image dudes who are like drawing one cool image and then you like squeezing the other panels uh, around that big image. And that's actually not that easy to do, Mm -hmm. you know, like the stuff that the image guys do. Uh, And that takes a lot of thought work that could have been better spent pacing out a a story. But here's the thing. If you compare this to those, a lot of those image comics, there's not much story, you know? So like you're you're doing the pizzazz, the visual pizzazz, whereas like there's a story here. So concentrate on the storytelling, you know, within those panels and making it readable. Um, ideas on dialogue where like he doesn't want the dialogue to just be exposition you know wants it to be more natural i think that's interesting and i think that there's a 
a pretty wide spectrum on that because I've heard like screenwriters, and I, I want to say David Mamet, but I may be wrong, talk about being very direct. Right. Um, so, and you then, know, and I, then, I think it, it, it varies. And I think of Ben Mara's dialogue that I like a lot. Yeah. And I think of his dialogue as being very direct. But then there was, so like Mamet is, is like that. But then Aaron Sorkin is like, this isn't, this isn't uh, people on the street. This is writing to be performed. So you can have a little sexiness to it. But what Gilbert is ultimately saying is like, you remember that time we tripped over that sewer lid and blah, blah, blah. And, and this like his his thing is like, OK, I identify in this panel to move the story forward. This has to be brought up. All right. So continuing forward through like storytelling, um, you know, perspective, light and dark. This is just him really getting into some of the craft. Yeah. There's some really fun, weird stuff like under storytelling. He talks about having two characters that are not facing each other, but are talking to each other. Yeah. I never, for some reason, this never occurred to me because it is a problem. You yeah. know, like, like if, if this is your character, really, if they're facing each other, you're seeing the back. Yeah. So that's a weird challenge, you know, like you don't want to just do all profile side by side. Uh, so he talks about how, like, you can have two characters that are, are facing us while they talk, but it works. Like, it seems like it, you know, like these two seem like they're interacting with each other, even though spatially doesn't really make sense if you think about it. It's comics, baby. It's amazing. Yeah, it's totally comics. And it's totally something that you would pick up from like a Harry Lucy, Archie, or Dennis mm -hmm. the Menace comics and stuff. Do you ever, you remember seeing the back of Joey's head very often? Exactly. And, you know, looking at his art reduced in size, I feel like it's more Archie than Jaime. And I always think of Jaime as being like a lot of Archie in his figures, but seeing this stuff like reduced for some reason, it's just really like I don't know if it's the figures, the way they're built or something, but it, I feel a lot of that Archie interaction. But that comics part, that comics language is part of what gra why I gravitate to his work and also like stuff I want to incorporate more of and stuff that I think a lot of people would benefit from from thinking about comics as comics. The Light and Dark, pretty fun. We're going to yeah. get an Alex Toth. A great cartoonist said, don't be afraid of using black and gives this example. And I absolutely love this example where our foreground is like this rock that's just all black. But I think equally the background is almost silhouette and white outline of like the buildings and some, some trees or shrubs or something in the background and a little bit of detail in between, you know, in the middle ground. It's so great graphically. Yeah, totally. And that's just kind of stuff that they, that they push. It's like a good kind of rule of thumb is like three levels of depth and in black and white drawing, you got black, white, gray. And, and gray is typically, like, the, it, it means the area where you're putting kind of, like, sort of more detail. Yeah, some marks and things. And and that's a great example, you know? It really like, is. So one, of the, one of the great guys in mainstream comics, like, w that applies that philosophy to great ends is, uh, take a look at Eduardo Rizzo in general, but, like, 100 Bullets in specific, and you'll see, like, all the different ways. You could do, like, a Wally Wood 22 panels of black, white, and gray that always work. And you'll see all those examples like in an issue of 100 Bullets. like Because it could be the front, the foreground that is the white part, or the foreground is the gray part. You could play around with that that triplicate in, you know, near infinite ways. Yeah. Talks about modeling and says, you know, Jaime's great at it, but doesn't like to do it. So he gets away from that. And you see it in those early Love and Rockets. You'll see like a lot more of the shading and, and things that he that Jaime does. Uh, Gilbert says that he's not as good at it and he knows his limits and he works around them. Again, my take and, and, and says, you know, a lot of like if you see like Marvel artists or something and this must have been like 92, probably when this was published around that time, probably the peak of that kind of modeling it like a Marvel style. And he says, you know, that's avoiding drawing like it's people it that may not how to know how to draw. And I used to see that criticism and I used to live that criticism. Right. You know, like I would render the hell out of stuff in my sketchbook and I didn't know what I was drawing. But that's the that's a real takeaway for me is concentrate on what matters. Like that rendering just isn't really the most important part. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a thing that like you're into as an artist or something like that, but like it doesn't affect the story or 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 anything like that. And and. Uh, it's, it's when what he's talking about is like, that's like when me and Jimmy are taking that tracing paper to some, to some of that artwork. And then you see how that leg is bent backward or whatever. It's like, if they put a little bit more time into that. It would be less glaring. And sometimes you, you can't always, it's not intuitive, like what it, uh, or it is intuitive, like, like what makes a drawing kind of fail. The, but the problem is it, it takes you out of the story, you know? And so it's like that pebble in the shoe where you're like, 
what the fuck am I looking at here? Mm-hmm. As you're reading a flowing story, if you stop to like question that and the cartoonist didn't want you to do that, like you failed at that page. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And what a dumb way to fail. Yeah. You know? uh, just talks about used to draw with a, he's been drawing with thinner lines, used to draw with thicker lines. Um, I think that's just natural. If you're going to draw comics for a long time, you're going to kind of ebb and flow with some of those stylistic choices. I don't know that he's saying one is better than the other. Yeah, all this stuff. Because like even the noodling shit, man, I mean, I have, uh, you know, whole he, pages where he did almost like a Van Gogh Starry Night in, in gray hatching on a splash page, you know, right. so like he'll, he'll, he, he goes back and forth. And this is another one of those page in progress, finished page, which I just love. It's kind of cool to see like where he's blocking in blacks, you know, early in the pro- process while you still have unfinished lettering and pencils, you know, next to like a, a basically a finished, uh, finished panel there. Um, figures and faces just talks about building his figures, you know, starting sketching the head, doing the body from there, pretty free form. He says, compares the way he draws kids. Most of this is about drawing kids. Yeah. So compares his and Jaime's techniques for drawing kids and how hard it is because you've got to exaggerate the kid a little bit if you're going to make sure it's clear it's a kid, not just a small adult. Right. Because in reality, the kid might be more of a small adult, but if you're going to do the cartoon, hey, I absolutely fell in love with this image. Yes. As a composition, I thought that was really amazing. Like, it feels like something that could be on a wall. He does that. And, and, and you know, so when when they would do those, like, early, like, G. Clay prints, like, Jaime's one would be the the image that's, like, the, the spines of the box set, where, mm-hmm. where it's, it's Maggie with that dude. And then uh, the Gilbert ones would be like a landscape of Palomar with a lot of sky, a lot of negative space up top. And he talks about in here, like he would like to do like more abstract looking comics and things. And to me, that's a like real piece of abstract art right there. Yes. But uh, dude, when, when I was like at, uh, in Seattle, like at the Fantagraphics house, like doing publicity for, for uh, hip hop family tree and shit, like issue one of, uh, was a blubber, his, his one yeah. comic was, was like he, they send their pages to Fantagraphics to scan and, all that shit. You needed to pull Gil Kane on those. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, dude, the Manila folder, like, was there. And I was looking through, like, all of Gilbert's originals and just could not fucking believe. I mean, it's all there. You know, there'll be a paste-up uh, dialogue bubble here and there or something like that. But it's all there. It's small as fuck. I think Blubber is on 9 by 12 Strathmore or something. <sighs> Super tiny. And, uh, you know, that's like his abstract, you know, just weird monsters and pissing and shitting and (laughs) all that kind of weird shit. That is a strange book. Yeah, yeah. He's that guy. Like, he exercises his creative demons. He doesn't abuse his Love and Rockets comic for his whimsies. So, like, when he has a weird fucking idea, maybe he'll make a bird land. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he'll make a blubber or something like that. uh, And never uh, inflicts that upon Palomar. Setting talks about the Palomar setting and how made up it is and whenever he started looking at reference realized like he has no electrical wires and no sidewalks and stuff and also says very similar to um where he grew up in southern california and i think all of that makes makes total sense it's kind of kind of great to hear it like articulated yeah but I, i to me that's another one where like it gives you permission to build that setting like you would build a character yeah because here we go defining characters and it's a similar kind of description of like certain elements you know Marcella being very masculine, big shoulders, big bone, you know, like there are these elements. And I feel like it, it applies the way he describes Palomar is really similar to the way he describes some of the character building stuff. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. You know, like if you're making, again, your own worlds in these in these comics, like that's a great way to approach it. That speaks to your Archie kind mm-hmm. of composition in terms of uh, the Gilbert stuff. Yeah. My favorite time. stuff when you hear the bros talk is all about their character building stuff. Like that is my favorite stuff to just sit down and listen to them talk about the shit because it is real to them and they really, really think think that stuff through so fucking deeply. And they have they It's have, here in this detail they section. Have, they have answers for everything. Yeah. And and I, I don't know what kind of work was done ahead of time, but I don't suspect that it's like they're writing biographies for each of these characters in a notebook. I don't think they're no. those dudes. It's just like once you identify a trait in a character, that trait is now a part of them, and you just got to keep them consistent and then add on to it. But you got to keep that one part consistent. That's actually uh, like one of the great things about the Carl Bark stuff is like those characters. They you put them in any adventure, plug them into anything, but they are who they are, 
and they're much more th- you think about context and like what's the superhero called the supermans and stuff and how how um flimsy th- those comics really were compared to the the stanley yes. comics or the barks comics and you s- that's where you see the true kind of master completely and the detail section here that he spells out is like this is an interior shot but he didn't want to draw like a whole inside of a house but this character et always appears in a jacket and a hat except he's inside so no jacket no hat and he says you know like it's a small detail and he's not sure if readers think about it but he thinks it works subliminally and that's what you're talking about like just really thoughtfulness yeah like how do you show an interior take the guy's jacket off you're right right and brilliant and have the phone have a wall like like that communicates yes the inside no problem again continuing with the character you know how he builds uh characters through the physical appearance with in the case of luba no makeup right wants to give her this more earthy kind of kind of appearance like like it's it's the tandem right like he's got big ass titties on her and you could go different directions with that man you could be just a total sex pot like comic book cliche stuff but he's giving her a million kids deglamorized yeah like taking the makeup off she can fix a car engine but then he's like but guess what guys still fucking love her yes (laughs) yeah yeah, it's fun. Uh, the guys, he says he could draw in his sleep, but he'll write notes on the women. And his wife says, why do you emphasize how attractive they are and not the men? You create this world of attractive women and stupid guys. And he says, well, that's how I see the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pretty fun. Yeah. He, he also talk, he also uh, he th- throws Durango under the bus. He does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Influences, you know. Some cartoonists will look at Jim Stranko's art and yeah, you can have fun with it, but he's going to teach you all the wrong things. I think we've said that in past videos, you know, it's part of the charm of that stuff. And it's part of the charm of a lot of comics art to me is, is where are the, uh, the inconsistencies, you know, because those quirks are what kind of makes this stuff fun, which is again, when you get to the guys who are really good or really accurate, I'm bored. Yeah. I want these kind of, uh, idiosyncratic elements. Look at those textures. I'm I'm far away from the image, but it looks great on the screen. Look at those, all those Lubas and all the different textures on her clothes and stuff. And And he's getting just a great balance of black, white, and gray within those images on that picture plane. So the, the very last piece here is Phases, and it's cool because he mentions Birdland as being like a breakthrough book for him. Yeah. It started to allow him to loosen up with layouts and poses. And uh, and he talks a little bit about, like, uh, I just mentioned, you know, these guys that are too accurate, they're kind of boring. And he says, like, whenever he started really being concerned about, like, how long is somebody's arm, where's the elbow fall compared to the wrist, his drawings became too stiff. Yeah. And so he became looser and a more confident cartoonist. This is another one of those things like I want to apply to my own work. Absolutely. You know, I'm much more interested in that kind of liveliness, looseness, confidence than I am in, oh, I want that anatomy to be correct. I don't care about the anatomy. I just don't. And these people that will criticize various artists for like anatomical errors or whatever, you you just don't have a sympathetic. I'm not part. I'm not with you. Yeah, I don't yeah, agree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. You know, like give me the story, give me the characters, give yeah. me those details. But I don't care about anatomical accuracy. Right. Go watch a movie if you want anatomical <laughs> yeah, accuracy. Yeah, go take a photo. Right. <laughs> you good to go, man? Yeah, I am. And again, everybody out there, if you want to make comics, like this is a heck of a document for really, really kind of seeing a different approach than the how to draw comics the Marvel way. Couldn't have said it better, Jimmy. Uh, kayfabers, uh, you want to mitigate that kayfabe effect. We're showing this uh, off on a live stream right this very moment, and you could be a part of that. If you are a part of our Patreon, hit up our description. Uh, hit up our link in the description below to jump on board and uh, check out these videos before anybody else. But uh, another way that you could do that is uh, by liking, following, and subscribing to the channel. Jimmy, tell the people what you have out there. Hulk Grand Design, February 22nd. Pre-order that one now if you haven't already. Uh, Street Angel, Deadly Score Alive, and The Plain Janes are both in print and available now wherever books are bought and sold. And I have my own Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see more of my art, my latest comics, and you can download some of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You see the bibliography in front of you. Uh, Red Room comics are my focus of, of the day. Two trade paperbacks out, Anti-Social Network, Red Room Trigger Warnings. I'm serializing new Red Room comics for 2023. I'm uh, going to put that stuff out in print later this year, but you can read it right now on my Patreon. Three bucks uh, for the archive. Put up new pages every Tuesday. 
Uh, hit the link tree in the description below this video to get to those destinations. Thank you guys for all your Christmas purchases and things. Jimmy, tell the people what else we have out there, man. Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts, merchandise, mugs, hats, fanny packs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel. Giving us marching orders will be on our way. Make more comics.